Hello and welcome, Blue Rooster Podcast. How you doing, Andrew? I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Special guest in studio here today, the one, the only, writer, director, philanthropist, entrepreneur, <laughs> all of the above, Charlie Chestnut. That's you, Mr. Chestnut. It's very nice to have you here. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Um, I'm ready for you guys to crack the old chestnut today. <laughs> the nut will be cracked. Let's, There's let's, no doubt about it. Let's get to the core. Well, I'm really glad you came in because all of this technical difficulty we've been having, we haven't been able to upload anything, and you're here to show us how to do that. Among other things. Right. We right. like to learn. That's the, um, that's the basic gist of this podcast here. And before I start talking to the chestnut and breaking it open, I, I want to get to Andrew real quick. To, so I guess you didn't win your Powerball. I did not. No, what a I'm bummer. still broke. I'm still, still broke? broke? Yeah. And how much did you end up spending? Do you even know? The whole process? All in all, probably about 40 bucks. $40? Yeah. You really thought you, you had a chance? You got to play to win. You thought you had a chance? No, I didn't think I had a chance. Uh -huh. But well, why? Why buy them? One, because whenever it gets that high, you have to. You just have, you to, have to go throw your money to the yeah. to the the guy at the gas station. It's a machine. I don't even have okay. to talk to anybody. How about yourself, Trust Chestnut? Didn't even play, but I will. You know, one thing that I'm thinking about. We're talking about this this lottery. Um, one thing my dad told me once. I thought this was pretty good. I always kind of keep this in the back of my head. Um, he said life is like the lottery. He said you got to be in it to win it. So in other words. If you stick around long enough, usually all the good things you want to see come your way, that they'll likely happen. Yeah. And I so you took one. that advice and decided not to play for the one billion. <laughs> <laughs> I like the quote. It's a very good quote. It's a rebel. You don't listen to your old man. <laughs> but I can, uh, I can understand that. I get it. Every day is a gamble. I, I chose mean, not to play either. So. Yeah. I just knew. I like to gamble with my life. It ain't going to be me. Right? Well, let me tell you something. Every time I'm on 376 here in Pittsburgh, I'm taking a gamble with yeah. my life. <laughs> you don't even have to go to the gas station to don't even have let to go them to know, hey, I'm heading out. I don't do even you have, have to pay. Do you have road, road rage? I think we touched on that a little bit last week. <clears throat> yes, I've, we did. I've had road rage <clears throat> before, and uh, the only time that I've been put in handcuffs was a result <laughs> of that, and that that's all I'm willing to say about okay, that. Okay, we'll leave it at that. The nut has officially been cracked. <laughs> <laughs> now, Charlie Chestnut here, you've led somewhat of an eclectic life, I would think. Uh, you've had more experiences than a lot of people I know, everything from living in New York City mm -hmm. to coming back and your career and different odd jobs you've had. Yeah, I would say so. Um, everybody says... You know that they'd like to write a book about something that's happened to them or their life story. Everybody feels like you know they might have at least one book in them. I can say proudly, I've actually done that. I've, I mean, I self-published it, <clears throat> but I did publish um, a book. It, it's fiction, but it's largely drawn from my my life. A lot of experiences living in New York City for about seven years. Um, so. Yeah, I think my life is interesting enough that I, I wrote a book. Now, growing up, high school, we'll just start from the beginning. Well, let's okay. go back to when you were a baby chestnut. Yeah, when that's what I wanted. You when born. you were still on the tree. <clears throat> well, you know. Before you fell from the tree. Well, the truth, in truth, I'm actually a Buckeye because I was born in Ohio. <laughs> I was born in Ohio. I was born uh, in the same hospital a week apart from Ben uh, Roethlisberger of Ooh. the Steelers. Finley, Ohio, in uh, in Finley Hospital. I was born in 1982. You lost that lottery too, because he won the lottery. <laughs> uh, he won the lottery, but um, th that's not a I lottery guess wealth that, that wise. I would like. Actually, I'd be more apt to be your friend than his. I think. I think so. I, I think I'd enjoy it, that friendship much more. But I'm sure, I'm sure all women would agree. <laughs> financially and uh, I suppose uh, athletically, you lost the lottery to him that day. Yeah, which but is fine. You know, um, very fine. I agree. I I actually I, not only do I hate the Steelers, I hate all football teams. I hate all sports. Um, I'm just one of those. You know, I guess I'm a Pittsburgh person, but 
that's one thing about this culture that I absolutely despise. I think sports are part of the dumbing down of America, and um, I just I don't support them uh, whatsoever. At the end of the day, that's what I don't get about these diehard fans. Like mm-hmm. when you're on your deathbed, does it really matter how many time how many Super Bowls the Steelers had? Well, plus that well, just blows my mind. Well, what's the connection? I mean, you know, people get really into their hometown team, but in all actuality, what is your real connection with them? There's nothing, but it's something to root. You know, you're always you want your team to win. Yet it's just like being at war. Just keeping the lemmings it. in order. Well, <laughs> that's actually an interesting um, parallel. I guess it is kind of like war. But you know, I I, I don't make war. I, I make love. Okay. I so <laughs> love was made, and you were be, you became the the Buckeye. I'm actually I'm a Pisces. It's interesting. My dad told me. Who knows if this is true. But he thinks that he can remember the day that I was conceived. And supposedly it was on water. It was on a boat, which is interesting because I love water. I'm a big swimmer. I love all things aquatic, and I am a Pisces. Now, Mr. So he remembers not, this. He was on, like, a cruise? Or he just, claims to remember this, but he does is he know also... Does position? <laughs> <laughs> well, when he says he was on the water, was he on a cruise? Or, uh, I don't or just think, he took the uh, sailboat out and had a little... But it was a kayak. A little bit to drink. It, it was probably like a shitty canoe or kayak okay. or paddle boat or something. <laughs> born on the water. I know there's that Creedence song, Born on the Bayou, but you were born on the kayak. Uh, conceived, at least. Yeah. Conceived, yeah. Conceived, conceived on the kayak. Yeah. Interesting. Now, the, what I, whenever I first met you, so this is where I'm getting at, is like, yeah. you are a genius when it comes to music and anything music. I've mentioned bands that I didn't think anybody knew. And you knew who everybody in the band's name was, which it was impressive to me. How how did you get so much into music, and when did that happen? Well, um, <coughs> as a child, uh, a lot of people don't know this, um, because I think I've tried to suppress it, but I, I was a dancer as a, as a young kid. What kind? Did. Like jazz, tap? Jazz, tap, and all that. Ballet? Uh, no ballet. But apparently I was pretty good. I was really into it. So I kind of had the that connection uh, with music. And, you know, growing up uh, in a household where my parents were, you know, constantly playing records, tapes, whatever. Um, VH1, MTV were constantly on. My dad would, you know, record music videos, just put a VHS in the in the VCR and just record, you know, random videos. And then we'd watch them back. I used to do so, the same thing. Yeah. And... So for me, it wasn't like, it wasn't even, it's not even something that I think about. It's just, it's kind of like always been there. And, you know, you know, to be fair, like, I guess that's how some people are with sports. You know, they were just kind of born into that. I was kind of born into, into music. So it's just, it's in my DNA. And, you know, Lou Reed once said that, and he wrote a song about it, rock and roll with the Velvet Underground. He says that, you know, his life was saved by rock and roll. And... I would say that's definitely true for me. Um, I think I became a serious music fan and really started to explore my own interests whenever, I think it was probably the onset of puberty, um, which is, you know, whenever a lot of angst starts to build up and, uh, you know, things things get a little bit rough. Chestnuts start doing yeah, weird yeah, things, becoming you know, the, full chestnuts, <laughs> exactly. growing top tops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you're getting ready to, you know, blossom. And it can be a painful thing. For me, it was kind of, um, for me, it coincided with um, puberty, like, around, like, 12, 13, um, with a lot of, like, anxiety, depression, which I, you know, battled my whole life. But for me, music was the thing that I connected to that um, I think really showed me that, uh, in a sense, you can kind of tran- transcend all that. Um, and I, I think that's true of all all art. It kind of it takes you to a different plane, and it can speak to you in a way that um, that other art forms do not necessarily. It's so visceral, and it just it you know they call it the universal language. Uh, I know that's cliche, but <clears throat> it really is true, and well, you can feel a lot from a song, right? And I think Definitely. that if it's a sad song, yeah. anybody can feel that. Exactly, <laughs> and I think that for me, you know, I was always very isolated. You know, I've I've been a loner all my life, but whenever I would put on headphones and, and listen to somebody, 
you know, whether it was like that very dark despair in uh, David Bowie's music or whatever, um, it, it's it's kind of like a good friend that, yeah. that, that's there with you. And you realize that you aren't alone because music can articulate feelings in ways that words are so limited, but music is, um, it just, it just kind of hits you. You don't even know, have to know how to speak. It's physical, I think. Sometimes. It's physical. It's very physical. You can and, feel it in your blood. Exactly. And that's why, you know, people dance. Um, so you think around puberty when most strange things happen to mm-hmm. chestnuts and humans yeah. alike yeah. is when you really got right. the, well, you know, it's, the aha moment with music. Exactly. You know, it's such a weird thing, that onset of, of sexuality, because nobody <clears throat> prepares you for that. And then before you know it, all of a sudden you're getting boners in class. Mm. And you did think you do the tuck? You have to do the tuck. I don't know if I did the tuck. That was the worst. When the I, bell rang. <laughs> you had to tuck it. Yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you this though. I think I, sort of. I that think because uh, I, I do weekly therapy, which I enjoy, because even if I don't really need it, I like to go within and sort of explore myself and and personal history and so forth. And I I've come to a realization. I think. Um, I think for me, the first time that I might have gotten, one of the first times I got truly terrified was uh, the very first um, erection that I had, because I thought that I had a disorder. Nobody Mm. prepares you for that. So for the longest time, I think for months, I thought that I was the only one experiencing this, and I had, I didn't put it all, I didn't put it all together, I thought I was special. (laughs) And so, whenever you're having all this weird, you know, stuff, you know, you, I mean, it's just, it happens against your will, and it, it, it kind of almost happens, yeah. uh, and it happens out of the blue. It's just, I mean, I remember the day, the, the first day it really? happened. I was like, I what the, oh, I remember the very boundary. first one, because it, it, it shocked me, and I really thought something was wrong, um, which has kind of been a pattern in my life, always thinking something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, kind of like pathologizing everything. Do so. you remember, Andrew, your first boner? My first boner, no. You I was probably either. getting them when I was like two. That happens. I remember that finding happens, porn yeah. whenever I was like, three and i just always looked at it that's interesting i had it hidden and i'd always look at it i didn't wow interesting that you just remember the first one oh i remember i remember the girl um i don't remember her name was kristen i won't say her last name but her name was kristen it was in a uh, science class so it was influenced it was influenced the rising of the chestnut i don't know if i kind of pieced it all together what was going on there so your first one was in school the most it terrifying was, boner you could have was that would your be a nightmare. nightmare. That's yeah. a nightmare. It, it was a total nightmare, and like I said, I thought something was wrong. And then whenever stuff started to, you know, um, uh, I don't want to the nurse. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you give look me at a that? hand? Help me out with this. Yeah, that's the thing, and it you know it was so embarrassing, and it's still kind of embarrassing to talk about, but it's just <laughs> it's part of life, and it's like you don't you don't choose for these hormones to all of a sudden kick in. And like I said, nobody prepared me for that. So, so I have a kid on the way. Yeah. Do you think at when he's like 10, should I give him a heads up? I think, I think you should. <laughs> yeah. I think you should. Yeah. I remember, I think I was, I was pretty young. I think I was like six or seven whenever my dad gave me the talk, but he didn't quite explain. I don't know if he explained at least not well enough the whole, you know, what's going to happen with your body or Maybe he did. It totally caught me off guard. So, I, I just I don't have like hardly any memories from childhood. Like I have a bad really? memory for one. Yeah. But six or seven that I can't differentiate differentiate six mm. or seven from nine or ten. Uh, yeah, for me it's kind of it's kind of murky too. And um, it's all just young or mm. you know teenage. Well, I mean it wasn't that great. I'm sure for any of us. So. Well, did you have any like life changing experiences in them years? Like, did you ever move to a new place? Like, that's Not how really I'm pretty like boring, I moved around a good bit. Oh, wow. then you so, have like, landmarks. Yeah, there's certain times where I could be like, yeah. oh, I was that age. Yeah, yeah. you can. That helps. You know? Yes, you can definitely differentiate by events, but I didn't have very uninteresting upbringing. So yeah, so I'll just for me uh, most vanilla. of my events were. I guess boners. life changing. <laughs> well, not only bo- not only boners, but um, uh, just like personal things. I was very much kind of in my own head. So, like, um, I actually, and I remember actually verbalizing this 
uh, I think, like, to my parents, like, I, it's not that I, like, longed for um, all these friends and stuff. It's like, I, I just literally was not interested. Like, I was just kind of very secluded. And um, so I think for me, you know, I kind of found my so-called friends, you know, like I said, you know, putting on the headphones and, you know, discovering music. That, that's why it's so important to me. And I think, like, at least half of my brain is, um, is you know, is music. I agree. Now, when did you make the decision in your head and the actual decision to follow through with moving to New York and why? Because you lived in New York City for how long and when did you leave to go there? Okay, let's see. I was 20. Uh, this was, t let's see, I moved there in 2004. Um, Boner 716. <laughs> <laughs> At least. If we're measuring time. <laughs> Um, what part of New York was it? Okay, so I was just really uh, kind of fed up with... So it wasn't like a high school decision. You weren't like in high school and it was like, I'm moving to New York City someday. Because a lot of people have that dream or that yeah. thought. Well, and, even the first time I went, I, it, wasn't a, it wasn't necessarily a dream. But the very first taste that I got of New York City was... Um, uh, I went to see David Bowie whenever I was 18... 18 years old. I was still in high school, and uh, I went with a friend. I took an Amtrak train into Manhattan, and uh, you know we saw David Bowie. And for me, it was very overwhelming, and I didn't have any what? desire. It wasn't even a thought that what I would venue? ever live there. Did he play it? Uh, he played at the Roseland Ballroom. This was an exclusive show for his uh, like fan club, his website members. And you were still. Living in the Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh area. Yeah. And you yeah. drove to... Took an Amtrak train. The whole way from like Pittsburgh to... Yeah. Oh yeah, my. That. That's yeah. a story in itself. Yeah. So, um, but I didn't have any desire. Like, I mean, it was a great show. You just but went there because that's where he was. That's where he was. Okay. And, um, Interesting. Right. But then I went to see him again. Uh, and, you know, this is sort of touching on, you know, why... Uh, I know we're going to talk about him later, but like how David Bowie became a huge, you know, part of my life, not just musically, but personally. Um, I went to see him again in, in 2001. Um, and this was for a, this was a Carnegie Hall benefit for an organization called the Tibet House. So um, it was just like, I think he did maybe like three songs, two or three songs. Um, but I went for that. I actually won tickets to that show from a David Bowie lyrics competition. <laughs> so, <laughs> what was that? Uh, it was actually in a chat room, and they would give you a random lyric, and then you had to, you know, the first person to type in the uh, the song, you know, would get a point. And I just, oh, nice. I, I, yeah, I you killed blew it. that one way. I imagine I, I killed it. Was and that so, all off the top of your head? Like there wasn't giggle. Totally no, no Google. I mean, wow. it was just instantaneous, instantaneous. It was people thought that I had like a program I was using to cheat, but mm -hmm. um, how many did you have to get right? I'm thinking maybe like 25 or so, wow. I'm, maybe less. But um, so I won tickets to that, and by that time I started to kind of get an interest in New York City. And then he played again in 2002, another exclusive, um, like fan club only uh, show. And then I started to really kind of get the bug and just realized that um, that I needed that energy. And it was somehow for me kind of calming to have constant uh, distraction and just, you know, just um, sort of sensory overload in a way was almost kind of calming. So, um, but, okay. but, but it is incredible because right around that time, I mean, like I was very anxious and... Um, Nobody thought that I was going to do it, and whenever I did move to New York in 2004, um, I don't think anybody thought that it was, you know, that it was going to last. So, what were you doing in this area at that time? Did you have a job or anything? Yeah, I was working as a Chinese food delivery man. <laughs> in so in this the city? Is, yes. Okay, because we don't have that shit around here. Oh, no, 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 here, here in, yeah. in White Oak. Oh, really? In White Oak, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Hmm. So you really, so you weren't really like um, weighing the option of do I leave this very um, bountiful career? 
Exactly. That had nothing to play in the part. Well, but... th- that's the thing. There was really nothing kind of holding me here. See, and... I always, I've always had dreams to you know do something like that, move, yeah. go somewhere. But I'm always just tied to, I don't know, I guess just family for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Well, you know, I I love my family, but at that point, I needed to get away. I just needed to move out. Number one, I needed to move out of my parents' place, and I needed, you know, I just needed a drastic change at that point in my life. I think I, I was I was 21 whenever I moved to New York. I just, I had like a suitcase, got on an Amtrak train, and lived there for seven years, and, um, you know, did my undergraduate degree there. And, uh, oh, so just, you did go to school there? Yeah, I went to school there, finished school. and um, Did you decide very... to do that before you left? Like, go through the application um, process and everything? Uh, I actually, I started, whenever I first moved to New York, I started, I did a semester at Hunter College. And I think if I'm honest with myself and looking back, that was just kind of an excuse to get to New York, like, oh, I'm going to do school there. Okay. Um, so that that was one semester, and then I waited a while, went back to... Um, to a very small private uh, school in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and had a really great experience. So, I, you know, my best friends are in New York City. Um, I saw just so many incredible shows in New York City, and the food and just everything about it, it was an amazing just the culture. Yeah, I, I basically spent my twenties in New York City, and it was a great way to spend them. And it's weird. I mean, I had the best time, but at the same time, I I went back for the first time since I moved back to Pittsburgh, um, in uh, actually for Halloween, this last Halloween, and I realized that uh, kind of the magic that I felt whenever I lived there was kind of gone, mm-hmm. and so I didn't. Ha- I don't have a strong desire to to go back. I I realized. It seems I've known you a, a decent amount of time now, mm-hmm. a few years, and yep. it seems like that. If there ever a town for you. I, I think that's it. Like mm-hmm. I, when I talk mm-hmm. to Andrew, I think like New Orleans. That's a town. Made oh yeah, for him. I can see that. Yeah. It's a lot of yeah. daylight activities. Sometimes activities that should be done at night. <laughs> this is New Orleans. That's yeah, why yeah. I think Andrew. That's a fitting I, place for I, him. I, I but could see him there definitely. Did yeah. you feel you? I don't know. I don't say fit in more in New York. Like you weren't. Yeah. So Did you yeah. feel at home there? alone? I, I, th- I I felt at home there, and like I said, even though I didn't feel the same kind of connection to the city. This last time that I visited, um, I I felt at ease as soon as the plane uh, landed in um, uh, it was LaGuardia. Um, I immediately felt at home and um, felt a sense of ease, which probably to most people is crazy because landing in New York City for most people is just like oh my god, you know, puts people on edge. But I felt very kind of safe and at home. So that's how my I've been to New York City a couple times. <clears throat> And every time I'm there, I'm I'm just too overwhelmed. There's just way too many fucking people. Yeah. Like you can look down as far as many blocks as you can one way and the other way, and that's all you see is people. It's it's just I um, was there a couple yeah. times and I I absolutely love it. And you wouldn't think I'd love it because I'm into like the farm life and right, all right. that, but it's just it's alive. It's literally alive. Yeah. That city's alive and I just I think it's everything that's great about America, really. It's everyone's doing their thing and I think so too. Chasing their dream in New York City. Yeah. So you were living in Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan whenever I first got there. I actually lived in fucking Harlem. Okay. Of all places. Did uh, you get a well, job at me? That's right down the street though, I, isn't it? Uh let's see. Har- well Harlem is on is you know It's upper, like right down uh the water isn't it? The coastline? The is that a coast, though? My river coast. Because it's, it's weird how it, it's shaped. Well, Harlem, if you take a look at um, a map of Manhattan... Um, it's right on the point, because I used to do a lot of work in Bayonne, New Jersey, which is right across, oh, okay. I guess, the bay? Is that what that would be? Uh, I mean, well, there's the... Um, on the west side, Sound. there's the Hudson, and um, and then you got the East River on the other side. I mean, it's, you know, Manhattan's an island. But most maps, it's funny because especially like tourist maps, they don't even show Harlem. It's like so far up and people kind of still don't want to go there. They, they say it's very, they, people claim it's like completely gentrified and really say nice it's on and the safe. Upswing, but it's, sort of like Irwin. And, and maybe it is, but it's still. Uh, so it's nowhere near Queens. No, no, it's, it's in Manhattan. That's what Manhattan I was Borough. thinking of was No, Queens. I did, I spent most of my time in Queens, yeah. Okay. I, yeah, um, I lived in Astoria and Woodside, both great neighborhoods. And really when you great. got there, did you immediately get a job? I did. I was working for a law firm called uh, 
Sherman and Sterling. It's, that's... it's like one of the biggest uh, like global um, corporate uh, law firms. Because yeah. you you have to have a job living in New York, correct? You have to. Um, Especially Manhattan. I mean, I was lucky. I mean, my, my parents helped, you know, as much as they as much as they could, and that that definitely made it possible. But yeah, I worked. Um, I got an, I got a job immediately. At first, I was uh, part time, and I didn't have a hu- I didn't have huge living expenses because I was renting a room uh, in Harlem, just a bedroom, with this Al Salvadorian family and this fucking cockroach infested <laughs> shithole, and. <laughs> Here's that, an ignorant, was, ignorant question. El Salvadorian, do they speak English? They do They do not. And, did, did. well, the, their English was very, very broken. Okay. Were they Spanish? Uh, they speak Spanish, okay. yeah. Okay. And this particular family, mm-hmm. had they spoke some broken English? Yeah. And where did they, where did they work? Um... Chinese oh delivery guys. <laughs> 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 they, they left the, they left the dream. <laughs> Little did they know. Um... The guy, uh, yeah, it was a couple, and uh, the guy worked for a hardware store in Harlem. I don't, I don't know where his wife worked. See, this I don't understand. So this family, they were probably living in a very small living quarters, correct? Yeah. Not making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Why go to the most expensive cost of living places, probably in the United States, when Honestly, you could go get that job? Well, you know, you know I don't get, not to get too political, but my <laughs> guess is, you know, maybe not everything was on the up and up. Okay. As, as is the case with many, as far many, as many people. Yeah. That, okay. Uh, th- that's my guess. That's an because easy place to blend in. That's an easy place to do it. I mean, every morning I would see on the corner, you know, maybe 15, 20, you know, Mexican immigrants, you know, just waiting, you know, likely undocumented, just waiting for a truck to come by uh, to hire a couple of them to do, like, odd jobs. For just the day. do work for the day. Yeah. Okay. You know, under the table. So. Um, you you can get away with it there. I, I think I think that's what it is. It's I mean it's a great city. It's a, it attracts the best of the best. It also attracts the worst of the worst. And how do you make friends in such a big? city? You said some of your best friends. Yeah. Or your best friends are. Um. Well, I I actually I made a couple of friends in college, but most of my friends were already my friends before I moved to New York, which made it a lot easier. And that was part of the appeal of moving there. And they lived there, you mean? Yeah, they lived there. And again, this was, um, you know, going back to Bowie, um, I knew a lot of fellow uh, Bowie okay. fans. Two of my best friends are, are big Bowie fans. So there was this really strong kind of community uh, built around, you know, Bowie fandom. As far as New York City... Some of the highs, the lows, and every mm. like specific highs were there lows where you were like, "This isn't for me." <laughs> yeah, yeah, you tend to forget those um, those <laughs> days today. or weeks, but um, you can remember your first. Boner, oh my god, <laughs> you can't remember the lows. <laughs> well, that's the, the thing. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. It's it's kind of suppressed. Well, I mean, I was uh, I was mugged once. It was an attempted mugging in the elevator in my building. This was in Harlem, and I had zero. Uh, you know, cash on me. So they actually gave me back my. They were really nice. Uh, <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they they went through my. The, okay, so I'm in the elevator, and uh, the one guy gets me in a headlock, and I start laughing because I'm like, "What are you? What are you fellas up to?" So the one guy has me in a headlock, and the other one uh, digs in my pocket, gets my wallet. They take a look inside. There's nothing in there, as is usually the Not case. Even the cockroaches from uh, the El Salvador house. I guess you know what. That, there probably was it like a credit card or a debit card in there, but they were. Nothing I guess they didn't want to bother with to that. Them. Okay. Nothing of value to them. So they they. So we're in the elevator. It gets to my floor, and you know the doors open. They, I'm still in the elevator. You're they laughing hit, still. I'm I'm it? freaked out beyond belief. I have no idea what to think. So they close the doors, go back down to the ground level, and they go. April Fools, nigga, and run out, run out of the building, and <laughs> just that's just because you had nothing, I'm guessing. Right? Yeah, because I had nothing. So they're like, oh, we were just kidding. Somebody already got this bitch. <laughs> yeah, they were very nice. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that that was kind of. I mean, that was one of my that was one of my first experiences uh, in the city. So. I kind of passed, uh, I guess I passed that test. Yeah, uh, yeah. I wanted to be there bad enough that that didn't deter me. Now, as far as lows, I mean, like, were mm-hmm. there any times where you were like, I'm lost, why am I here, I want to go home? Um, 
I'm sure that happens to everybody, though. Yeah, but you're not in uh, that atmosphere. Never, I, I don't think I ever seriously considered it, but, you know, um, to a large extent, living in New York can kind of be a struggle to some degree every day. Um, I, I'm sure those thoughts did cross my mind, but I never really seriously... How about highs? Were there anything, like experiences that happened there that no oh chance God. in hell could happen here? I mean... Honestly, um, there are so many I wouldn't know where to begin. Mm-hmm. Just unbelievable. Are those mostly based around like some of the amazing performances you've seen? Yeah, or amazing just everyday. Amazing performances. Um, a lot of the greatest moments were just like really strange and bizarre things that happened. Um, going to school there, you know, was amazing. Um, Working at Thirty Rock. Yeah, I worked at NBC. Uh, that was that was amazing. Now, um, did were you? Just to familiarize, familiarize everyone, you were, you worked at the front desk at Thirty Rock or something along those lines. I worked um, at the facilities help desk. So, like, whenever one of the studios or office executives or whatever like um, needed something building related, I would create a ticket. I, it was more. I mean, it, it's kind of a, I guess a customer service related um, position. But like, let's say the Saturday Night Live studio had like a blown out bulb, I would send the electricians, or if there was. A fire alarm. You know, you, you contact the the electricians or whatever. Now, the Saturday Night Live um, performers, did they have to walk by you to get to work? Oh every yeah, day? yeah. I mean, that that was kind of a cool thing. Like we had this big, really big cafeteria, really nice cafeteria, and sometimes you would see them in there. I'll never forget one day, uh, Seth Meyers came in, and he just kind of took a look, a quick look around, and got this really sour look on his face, like this food just was not good enough for him, and just walked out and like smug. Smug. He's oh, yeah. he's a, he's a, he's he strikes me as smug. He does. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a fan. Huh? Did you happen to see LCD sound system? System? No, and I I would have loved to. Um. Uh, by the way, James Murphy is um is on the new, uh, on the new Bowie record. Really? Yeah. Uh, he does some percussion. Um, but no, I I never saw them. I, I would have liked to. Because that was one of the bands. That I mentioned to you, I had no idea anybody knew. Yeah. And you, you're like, oh, yeah, that's uh, so-and-so and so-and-so. I still, yeah. I don't even know their name. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I, w- I would have loved to have seen them, but, yeah, I, I guess I think they're broken up now. So, moving along, what was it? Why'd you come home? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I, I lost my job at NBC, and I had just graduated, Lost as um, in laid off or did something um, warranted? I, I was a whistleblower, <laughs> as I have been my whole life, and okay. it just didn't... Um, didn't sit well with it, the... It didn't sit too well. Interesting. But um, in hindsight, you know, maybe it was time. Um, did Seth Myers get you fired? <laughs> he, he, he did not. He did not. Um, no, I, I, guess, I guess ultimately I got, I got myself uh, fired. Um, so I took that pretty hard. And I had just graduated, so I was I was feeling pretty optimistic about the future because I was like, well, now I have at least a degree under my belt, um, which I didn't have before. So I felt optimistic, and then I, I got a job um, in New York City. Yeah, in New York City after um, after the NBC um, fiasco <laughs> <laughs> debacle, and. Uh, it turned out that this job, it was like a teaching job. It, it, it was very strange. But anyway, it was a scam, and I never got paid, and it turned out the whole thing was a front, wow. and it was just really kind of mind-blowing. So th- there were like a lot of, I think the universe was kind of telling me, you know, maybe wrap it up or take a break. What were you teaching? Um, I was teaching um, different subjects. This was actually a program for like LPNs to become RNs. And, um, wow. And so there, there was like a general studies component to this, and you know, I, I guess I would would have been teaching writing and so forth. But uh, I was there for like three weeks, and I was recruiting people, and I had no idea I was recruiting people into a scam, into so, the pyramid scheme. To yeah, take um, your position. yeah, yeah. So this woman that was running this whole thing, she, she was eventually arrested, um, <laughs> and I, I, she's now actually I looked her up. She's running a um, basically another scam. She has like a Christian. Uh, organization for women that have oh, been in they prison. They have lots of money. They, yeah. They have well, yeah. lots of money to That's give. That's the thing. I mean, now she's turned she's to God. She's in the right, right uh, yeah. set of uh, 
Goals it's, in life. It's a good, well, that's, you know, <clears throat> it's a business. It's a, <laughs> it's a scam. So after that, you didn't take another job? You said it's time? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were... And how long after the end of your last job did you stick around? Or was it immediate I'm out of town? Um, I imagine it's not very easy I to live in New York without income. Yeah, I don't think it was... I don't think it was all that long. I was getting unemployment, and I was getting, you know, pretty good, empl- um, a pretty good rate of, of unemployment. So I, I wasn't totally in dire straits, but I definitely panicked. And, um, you know, my dad uh, had had health scare, and um, I, I guess that I just felt um, overall that, that it just felt right to kind of come back. Um, not that it was totally easy. I mean, I missed New York, and I kind of resented it and definitely had – second thoughts, but I'm kind of at the point now, um, you were saying you're, John, you're kind of like a farm person and I've kind of like done a complete 360. And like now my fantasy is to like live in a cabin in the woods. In fact, there's a really great, uh, Tum- I, do you, do you guys do Tumblr? It's like one of these, I guess it's a social media. I don't use it, but I'm familiar with what it is. Oh, yeah. I thought it was like a yoga. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's actually the opposite of, okay. of yoga, really. <laughs> But Tumblr, I've, heard, I've heard of it. Yeah, so yeah. it's mostly people it's posting app. pictures. Yeah, yeah, you can get it as an app, but it's T-U-M-B-L-R, Tumblr. And um, there is a Tumblr, I guess, blog or whatever, Tumblr page called Cabin Porn. <laughs> and it's just really beautiful, charming pictures of, like, just beautiful, a lot of them rustic cabins, some of them very modern, just all different kinds of cabins. And... Uh, and I love that so much. They put out a book. I bought it on Amazon called Cabin Porn. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. I recommend it uh, to anybody. If you can get your hands on it, get so that So there's book. not naked ladies in it? There are no the la- naked ladies it's in there. Like, the so porn. it's like food porn. Yes. Yeah, okay. Right, okay. right. It's, like, it's kind of like food porn. Um, and it's just, it's That's really boring. beautiful. But that's kind of my... Uh, my fantasy now is the complete opposite, is to just kind of yeah, retreat. Yeah, uh, different end of the spectrum from New York City. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. What do they call? What do locals call New York City? Like, um, uh, the city. The city. Yeah. Okay. And most people that live in Manhattan don't consider the other boroughs New York City, generally. But even though you know they're all New York City, but people refer to Manhattan as generally as the city. I, don't know, I guess it's like an elitist. Okay. Well, is that where Market Square is? Union Square. What's the one with all the sign? Oh, uh, Times Square. Times Square. Time Time Square. Square. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Times... Is that Manhattan? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's like uh, that's mid Midtown Manhattan. I smoked yeah. weed there. You did. Yeah. Oh wow. Right in the streets. Well, <clears throat> I ate mushrooms there too. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, especially in Harlem. I mean, I would see people smoking crack on their stoop. Um, he did that too. Frequently. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I, I had some, I had some good weed in in New York, no doubt. Now, so you leave New York, yeah. you come back, and what's going through your mind? Um, what was going through my mind basically is what's the next stage of my life. So I just I had that degree, and I was considering graduate school. I'd actually applied at NYU, and I think I got in, or maybe I didn't even complete the application process, but I, I was going to do um, a master's, I think in like technical writing at NYU. And so... I was definitely thinking about, you know, it was like a definite going to graduate school. So I looked at schools around here and I ended up going to Seton Hill and um, did like the teaching track um, to become a teacher, uh, secondary education. And um, I did very well. I was was very successful um, up until my student teaching experience. I had a really bad experience. Um, Just didn't get along. Like the, the teacher that they paired me up with was in my opinion, um, you can just say a, cunt. A, a psychotic cunt. Okay. <laughs> so you blew she was another a cunt. whistleblower experience, or I don't know if I, kind of. I mean, it was like a it was a weird confrontational thing, um, but I wouldn't say I was a whistleblower per se. Um, but it was just, and I think the whole experience, unfortunately, you don't really know until you start doing it. So in my student teaching uh, semester, I just kind of realized. Um, this is this is not for me, which is a very expensive lesson, but um, but you know a, a a valuable lesson nonetheless. So yeah. So 
we'll fast forward and get to your current job. Yeah. So I went from considering beco- being a uh, uh, like a high school teacher to going into the porn uh, business. Sort of like porn and sex toy from business. New York City to a cabin. <laughs> exactly. Big, big job. My life is uh, has just been a lot Revolving of extremes. Door. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of a lot of extremes. Did so. you seek out this job or did it? No. No, I mean, I'd always been interested, uh, I mean, I've always had an interest in, in the in, arts and in, in, in sex. Mm-hmm. And um, since that first boner, since that first boner, you know, I went from and again, I went from being extremely scared of that to, you know, pretty, I think, pretty open and comfortable with, um, you know, with sex. So um, my my undergrad degree is in English. And I think one of the things that I I'm completely confident that I can do well is write. So I was looking for a writing position, and um, I found uh, I, f- I found a couple of possibilities, but none of them paid anything. I mean, it just wasn't it just wasn't doable. So I found this data entry job um, for the for this adult company. Um, they're an online, basically a retailer. They're more than just a online retailer but um it, it's an adult company they sell adult products sex toys porn you name it and uh they had an opening for data entry but it did involve um a good bit of writing basically writing uh reviews blurbs um and so forth for the catalog for the now, website where do you find a job listing like this craigslist yeah? which is I've, i have found many 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 things on craigslist from uh hookups to apartments, jobs, you know, Craigslist is it's a good thing. Okay. Did you ever have like a bad experience with Craigslist? Like I always uh, hear horror stories from Craigslist. Let me think. I mean, I've sold stuff on Craigslist. I think I might have maybe even bought a few things. Um, uh, bad experience. Um, As like you go to meet no. somebody and you're like, oh shit, I'm in a fucked up situation right now. No, you're no. not Craig. <laughs> no, 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 I've, I, that fortunately, um, has never happened, no. Oh. But the job was found, how does, how does the interview go for that kind of job? Um, yeah, because it's internet re- based, so is it like over the phone, mm-hmm. over the internet? No, I mean, it, it was at the, um, it was at the company. Um, so it's a at, local company. It's a local company, and, um... <clears throat> Yeah, I just met them there in the conference room, and there was really nothing unusual about it. Um, they just made sure that uh, that yeah, I was comfortable with that. Into... Yeah, made sure I was comfortable with that material, and um, yeah, it was. It, and really, once you get over sort of the novelty and, and the shock of you know working with very explicit content, uh, it just becomes like any other job. Huh. Um, there are a lot. Of, I mean, it it's boring. <laughs> it's boring. I can see that being boring. Yeah, it is. And frankly, you realize pornography itself is pretty boring. And They're probably, as the actors, I would imagine, are the same way. Yeah, yeah. Gotta go to work. And, and you this see so many job. of the same faces in the in the movies. And um, <laughs> I'm more interested in the novelties aspect of it, like the toys and um, you know the lubes and all that. Like I find that more interesting. Pussy it, jelly. Yeah. They actually they have something called pussy juice, which is. Um, <laughs> it's uh it's a lubricant that supposedly i i need to try this but supposedly so you don't get to test any of the stuff uh you can actually if you if you request it to test something um you have to write a review and then they'll they'll give it to you what about pocket pussies what oh, do we, they call that Fleshlight? they sell Fleshlight. so many fleshlights like pocket pussies they are hugely popular uh, have popular. you tried one um i have is it what do you i think? have um, I mean, it's just like a dead piece of meat. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, I mean, basically, it's it's the type of thing like opposed to a live piece of meat. <laughs> it's the type of thing where like it seems like oh this might be a good idea, but like kind of during and especially after you're like what the fuck very happened to my shameful, life? Yeah, yeah, very shameful. I could, I could, I could understand. It's that. like, and, you know, and and it's a whole fucking process too because you take you take the fleshy part out of the flesh light. And you soak it in 
like hot water to get it warmed up to get it more. I was gonna life-like. say, is there a heating element in it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I think that'd come with a lot of shame. Yeah, and then you put it back in, and then you know you lube it up, and then you got to clean it, and it's just, and then you have to powder it because it's like <laughs> a lot you of know, maintenance. To keep, it's a lot of maintenance. What's the new project product you're talking about? Uh oh yeah yeah yeah. Oh so, the lovely Stacy. <laughs> Oh, bring uh, beers. Perfect. Thank you. Stacy just brought us more beer. Bless your heart, Stacy. We're talking about pussy juice. So <laughs> pussy juice is a lube that supposedly smells like a vagina. Ugh. Yeah. Like a, I don't know, every, every vagina smells different. They do. They do. And uh, I've been, I've been very lucky. Uh, for me, I, I've never encountered uh, what they call uh I guess bad, bad pussy. Oh, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, this juice, do you think it comes in different, like, scents? Like, no. Then, like raw salmon and <laughs> flower <laughs> patch. <Damn. laughs> oh. Well, there's a lot of different smells <laughs> to that area. Cocoa butter. So I don't know how someone could isolate one per- specific smell and say, this is what it's going to yeah. smell like and... You know what? I'm I mean, guessing... are we talking this? We could do flavors yeah. from like you know, New York City late at night to <laughs> uh, Harlem hot, fresh, <laughs> hot, <laughs> hot, af- hot after the gym, <laughs> hot, oh. hot 1987 Chevy Fuck. Cavalier with no air conditioning. Um, there's there, one standard. There, there's I one suppose. standard. But you know, I'm guessing that a lot of the guys that use this pussy juice have never actually experienced a, a real <laughs> vagina, so I don't think that they would know. Shame. I'm imagining that Shame. we'd be very overwhelmed by the amount of... Shame. I think everyone would probably be overwhelmed by the amount of product that's flying mm. off the shelves. Correct? It's amazing. You should see our warehouse. Um, the warehouse is in uh, Warrendale. There, there was recently like a big industrial fire up there, so... <laughs> a lot of burnt plastic. Yeah, <laughs> almost. Yeah, we, we, luckily we we weren't uh, we weren't really affected by that. But um, yeah, whenever whenever you see it, it's incredible, and you just realize what a huge, huge industry. Oh, it's a huge business. It's, it's unbelievable. Isn't porn one of the biggest? Yeah, uh, I think I think porn makes you know altogether probably more than mainstream. Um, mainstream what? Mainstream movies, you know. Uh, I think I've seen the statistics on that, um, and I th- I think porn, the porn industry makes more altogether. I mean, they probably pump out a lot more product right. too, and they have less production costs and so forth. But and it's expensive. It, like I've been to a porn yeah. shop; it's not yeah. and nothing's cheap. No, no, you're no. paying top dollar. Yeah, the, the markup is incredible, um, <laughs> and like with the sex toys, you have to pay a lot of money to get something uh, of quality. Uh, m- most of it's junk, frankly. Now with um, you said you would do reviews. Yeah, reviews. I mean, a lot of them weren't so much um, not not so much reviews. It's just kind of like write ups. Um, like a description. Yeah, yeah, descriptions. Right. Yeah, for the catalog, for the website. Do you have any like good ones? Like, or were you pretty uh, straightforward? I'm, I'm actually very proud of a lot of them. Um, <laughs> Is there anywhere we could see your work? AdultEmpire.com. Uh, you can okay. uh, look up, look up the uh, PDFs of of the uh, actual paper catalog or, or request a catalog, um, and then I've also done some of the like write ups on on the website itself. Yeah, Ooh. AdultEmpire.com. After you write a review, does it say like by Charlie Chestnut? No, no, it doesn't have a byline or anything like that. So you'd which have is to probably let us good know which ones are you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing that I like about it is that it keeps me. Um, it does. It does keep me creative, actually, because it's very difficult to say something new um, about porn. Because I mean, it's so much of the same, and you can only, you know, there are only so many words you can use for cock and pussy and fucking and ass tits, whatever. You gotta get so creative. You gotta get creative. So, um, all right. Say we're watching a porn mm-hmm. with uh, one dude, one Asian guy. Mm-hmm. And five Mexican Latino <laughs> women. Yeah. What what would you write? To set, that? I'll give you the setting. We're gonna be at a abandoned roller rink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Bright lighting. Disco ball. An old one, but it's in service, 
somehow magically for this shoot. <laughs> now, go for it. Write a review. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'll I'll do like a I'll do a blurb. Um, okay. Should we name these people, or you want to name them? At least. Uh, well, you know, I mean, yeah. Usually, Alexis. you'll just say who's who's in it. Um, okay, so Mr. Mr. Magato <laughs> is the Asian guy. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, off the top of my head. Okay, so Mr. Magato. Um, Mr. Magato is looking to dip his uh, crispy egg roll <laughs> <laughs> in a in a heaping helping of duck sauce. Of uh, okay, so they're it's 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 Latina women's of um, sriracha of sriracha flavored duck sauce. <laughs> um, as he pounds that pussy like a pro. Um, in the it was an abandoned... Abandoned uh, roller rink, yes. In the abandoned roller rink. Um, this roller rink hasn't seen this much action... Uh, since, since YMCA was hit. <laughs> since mustaches were... Were... Uh, were... I don't know. All over porn. Off the cuff? Excellent. <laughs> excellent. I'm buying. So, I'm buying what you're saying. <laughs> Are, you're technically Not just my write, best work. writing... Uh, what you read on the back of the box? Um, I mean, you'll, people you'll... don't really buy porn yeah. DVDs or VHSs no. anymore. It's all internet, correct? Well, actually, people do buy DVDs. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable how many people do, and, and that blows my mind. A huge, like a huge chunk of the clientele, um, like are in their eighties. Like a lot of customers around oh, like, no. like eighty-seven or so. So um, they might not be on the internet. And then there are just collectors who just want to have the <laughs> who want to have the hard Always product. Forget about you know what that. I mean? It's like it's kind of like you know some people like download it, their music. But is it ever really changing? Like porn, <coughs> porn's porn. Porn isn't Trends really that, changed. Well, I think that a lot of the sexual acts and the fetishes that are portrayed in the scenarios do kind of change, and they kind of reflect whatever. Um, a lot of times, it, it, I think it reflects sort of maybe a dark aspect of the psyche or, or society um, there seem right now like there there's a huge interest in like granny porn uh, trans the transsexual thing is huge transsexual porn um, and you know the transsexual uh, transsexualism I guess is you know that's a hot topic in society right now so that's that's big in porn right now and you see um, you know, just like really depraved stuff. Everything's anal. I mean, everything is about the anus now. <laughs> and I don't know what that says about us that we're just we're so bored. Or I, I, you I don't think know. that's what it is. Like porn's almost nothing anymore. It's just regular yeah, porn. Yeah, just... yeah. It's not. It's not good enough for for people. Um, the tr the the truth is, I think that at least at least ninety percent of this porn is disgusting, depraved. I don't think that it's necessarily morally wrong. I don't want to see it censored. I'm not for that, but I and I don't think the porn is necessarily creating so much of the problem. I mean, it, it may for some people, but I think that porn, like any other, <clears throat> if we want to call it an art form, is really an expression of um, you know what's going on in people's heads and what's going on in society. So if you see a lot of this violence and sex, I think that 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 says something about people. <clears throat> I agree, hundred percent. I feel like yeah. the, the the act of anal is almost like an act of aggression. It's it's a very angry act, an act of control. Um, which is why I don't even want to necessarily get in depth into um, talking about homosexuality. But like with homosexual men, I've never understood. Um, I just I just to me it's kind of a shame uh, to kind of say you know what I I think I'm gonna give up on pussy uh, completely. Uh, I think I just I can't. Im Imagine that because the anus is not designed for entry. Yeah, I mean, if you want to say design, if, if there, if you believe in the concept of design, uh, it's not necessarily designed for entry or pleasure. And to me, it's you know uh, one of the re most redeeming, beautiful things about sex is that hopefully you're engaging in a mutual ex exchange of, of pleasure uh, simultaneously. So, but then again, I mean, there are a lot of people that some will girls say, like anal. Well, and a lot of guys like it too. They like the prostate uh, stimulation, I guess. Um, 
but it's just uh, it's it's very hard for me to um, to grasp, I guess. So, uh, but again, it's it's not a for me it's not a moral issue. It's just um, I guess what I'm trying to say is whenever you're uh, inside of a woman and experiencing that, for me, that is just one time whenever you're like, there has to be a god. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I mean, that's what Mr. Magato said. <laughs> <laughs> and hot, I mean, hot lights at the roller rink. All right, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm a big fan of pussy. I don't understand how, how people could uh, could not be into it, but that is the case. and uh, I never looked at it that way, but... Yeah, that's just yeah, yeah, that's the case. I mean, but uh, you also got to think of it. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of women that... Obviously, women don't have a cock to put inside a woman, but... According to some of the movies he's reviewed, <laughs> I disagree. <clears throat> well, the strap Yeah, but they're still, who... they're still... Yeah, but she's not getting any pleasure right, from Right, 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 right. <clears throat> well, that's the thing, you know, and then that gets into, like, what is pleasure? Like, is it just a tactile, physical thing? Or is it, you know, the, the psychological and, and emotional aspect of it, too? Like the music thing. The music is physical, but mm -hmm. also psychological. Yeah, it's true. It's true, and I, music is, is very sexual, too. Um, or at least it can be. Um, you know, depending on the artist. Um, so, I think that um, what, what I'm getting at here is different strokes for different folks. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. I remember that whatever movie. you're into. That was whatever you're one. into. And people are... <laughs> People have, I mean, some of the fetishes and in, in these different niches and in, um, in in porn are, are are really interesting. It's kind of opened my eyes. If you can conceive it, it's been done. It's being done, and there's not just a couple of people, but probably a, a, a sizable audience for that particular um, fetish. And I think that that's fine. I think anything between consenting adults, fine. What kind of porn are you into, John? I like straight, just man and woman. Maybe a little bit of romance, even. <laughs> I don't like any aggression. Hey, listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't like. I don't like more than two people at mm -hmm. once. Yeah, yeah. I'm not into the girl and girl, honestly. I'm gonna I, give it. I just, and I'm sorry to cut you off, John, but I got go it while it's in my head. I got to give a shout out to pro probably my favorite porn uh, company. See, I like the true amateur, not just like amateur, like produced by a company. I'm talking about like homemade. 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 Right, that's what I like. But in terms of the studios, there's a studio called AbbeyWinters.com. Abby Winters. Shout out to Abby Winters. Okay, I'm writing that They down. make some of the best porn. It's like, first of all, they, they claim they're real couples, and they'll tell you like how long they've been together. Mm -hmm. And like it's like real natural lighting, not this nasty kind of lighting, and like just like natural looking women. Um, you know, none of these boob jobs or like the slutty makeup or anything like that. And it's just like it's it's not like aggressive. It's not. It's real. It, it's real. It's real, and the women look real, and like the guys aren't all nasty and like looking like Ron Jeremy. So, um, that that I I th you know you should look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I like. It's it's, it's, a, it's a lot like. of girl on girl, but then they have this series called Girls and Their Boys, which is just couples, and it's. Um, I'm into, the, I'm into the couples. Yeah. What celebrity has the best porn? Mm. Like a sex tape? Yeah, or like, yeah sex tape. What uh, was the best sex tape? I think the biggest selling one, or, or at least the most popular, is the one with um, uh, Ray J and Kim Kardashian. That was the best? I guess. I, have, I don't have um, much interest in that. I, on a kind of almost like morbid curiosity level, I, I really enjoyed seeing uh, Tanya Harding. I don't know if that made it to a tape, <laughs> but it was, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of enjoyed that. I don't know. I kind of have like a, I don't know if it's a fascination or a fetish with kind of like trailer trash, but, um, <laughs> which is by the way, like a genre trailer trash porn. Oh, yeah. I just like, I have a fascination with like white trash and Hicks and just like. That's because you want to be in a cabin. Exactly. I got cabin fever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's change gears, I think. Okay. All right. All right. Now, Charlie, you are a believer in meditation and a practicer? Yeah. Um, every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you set aside how long every day? Okay, so the type of meditation that I practice is uh, transcendental meditation. And I first heard about Transcendental meditation. I mean, I think I may have heard like the Beatles, kind the of made it very issue, yeah. right. Yeah, um, kind of popularized it in the in the sixties. But 
yeah, I practice transcendental meditation. We call it TM. Um, TM is basically, they, they, it's not necessarily a spiritual thing. It's not a philosophy. It's not a way of life. Um, you know, atheists do it. Religious people do it. All different kinds of people do it. It's a mental technique to transcend the mind, to transcend thought, to completely make the mind uh, still and go within and just enliven um, enliven the self it's it's um, it relaxes the body it has it it's it's a highly um, it's been studied uh, in a scientific manner by many 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 universities and so forth there are many 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 published peer-reviewed studies on the many benefits of transcendental meditation now you don't go into doing transcendental meditation to take care of or deal with any one particular problem. You just do it. It's not like you focus on anything. It's not... Um, that's like the opposite of the point, it, right? That's the opposite of the point. Um, yeah, it's to basically go within, transcend the mind, and just experience that self, which they say, you know, has always been there, always will be. Uh, that true, essential self, and just kind of enliven it. And the benefits for the mind and the body are incredible. The American Heart Association said that do, regular practice of TM can cut your risk for mortality from heart disease in half. So there's like no drug out there that can claim to do that. So <clears throat> it it just has incredible benefits. I um, mean, you do it every day. Yeah, you do it every Without day. Fail. I mean, you personally. Yeah, um, I like, have I have missed today? I actually I did not because I like basically rolled out of bed. But okay. I I will make sure I get in my first meditation and then do a second meditation I try to do it twice a day yeah and yeah how long per session or is that just all relative? uh 20 minutes uh each meditation <clears throat> twice a day so can you lose track of time while you're meditating yeah time kind of uh time kind of disappears almost like a clock you don't really think of uh of time and ho hopefully you know the deeper and deeper you go you don't think so much about anything but, uh, but at the same time, it's important to emphasize you don't try to stop thoughts either. And that's why a lot of other forms of meditation are, are difficult for people because it's about thought stopping. This is a mantra form of meditation. You silently, uh, in, in your head, repeat this mantra, which they call, it's almost like reverse, they call it reverse hearing. So instead of hearing the sound and having it come into the into your ears and be processed, you're almost doing it. Um, kind of head. right, right, and so you can pick your own mantra, or is there no? It's a set it's mantra? it's assigned to you. Oh, oh it's assigned okay. to you based. So, so based it's just like on, any other meditation. <clears throat> well, it's it's definitely it's not like any other meditation in that. Well, as far as the mantra goes, like oh, somebody gives it to you. Yeah, somebody will give you a personalized is it a, like mantra. A hum, or is it a sound? It's a it's a sound. It's not um, the the sound should not have any meaning. So it shouldn't be, like, if you meditate on the word, like, Maharishi, who brought this technique to um, kind of popularize this technique and <clears throat> standardized it and brought it, you know, to um, to the West, um, he used to say, you know, like, if you met, let's say you use a mantra like pencil, well, inevitably, you're going to think about, you know, that pencil. And 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 the whole idea is to transcend uh transcend them you know thoughts in the mind go go deeper so it's not contemplating anything and it's not at the same time it's not stopping any thoughts either it's just returning to this mantra almost it's almost kind of like an anchor that uh just pulls you down deeper 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 so uh you just you return to the mantra very effortlessly and without fail it works every time whether you believe it whether you believe in it uh whether you think it's going to work or not it just you, uh, me personally, I go deep every time. I mean, it works. It just works. So you can't teach yourself. You need an instructor. Yeah, it's it's a very personal thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you have to really do it one on one because it's so. It's just such a subtle thing. It's they, they'll even admit, <clears throat> TM the TM organization that it's like ridiculously simple, and that's part of why it needs to be one-on-one -on -one, cuz that concept is really difficult for for us you know in our society especially where you know you have to try to get 
to some place. You have to earn, you know, it's almost like you have to earn relaxation or earn pleasure and work for it and work hard for anything of value. So this idea of effortlessness, it's, it's just, it's very, very subtle. It's a very subtle thing. So, um, yeah, it is important to work with the teacher and, and get your, get your uh, proper mantra and know how to use it. Well, can you, like, say, um, so you have to, you have to, like, sign up for courses and such. Well, it's four days in a row, maybe like an hour and a half each day. So say you're not willing to do that. Do you, is there any benefit to just meditating on your own and trying to figure it out, or you just never get there? Well, you know, you're not really trying to figure anything out, per se. Um, I mean, I guess you could uh, you could certainly attempt. Uh, there's, all, there's so many different kinds of meditation that you can do. This is just one technique, and this one mm -hmm. okay. has just been consistently, scientifically validated. Well, and... How do you know if you're meditating? Like, mm. say, you're, say you just go with the mindset, you're like, I don't really have time to go do that. I just want to yeah. take 20 minutes out of my day and just clear my mind and get right with myself. So you sit down. Mm -hmm. Hey, number one, do you have to be sitting, or can you be in any position you want? Like, can you lay down? No, they're... <clears throat> well, they... You're not, um, it's very easy to slip into sleep whenever you okay. meditate. So it's, it's important, uh, they, the recommended way to do it is sitting in a chair or in a chair? Sit, sitting in a bed. I mean, just what sitting. about the Indian style cliche. Yeah, thing. You can do that. You can do that if you want, but there's no, there are no like real rules or anything. Um, it's not like you have to, you know, uh, burn incense or sit a certain way. I mean, you can be slouching, you can be, you know, sitting up straight. That's it. It's inconsequential. And then, like, like, how do you know if you're meditating, or is that a very ignorant yeah. statement? <laughs> no, I don't think it's a an ignorant statement. I think that um, you know that you're meditating whenever you're you've got your eyes closed. You're sitting there, and you're just you're doing your mantra. Okay, okay you're doing the mantra. it. All right, and you're not like it's. This is important. Like, you're not trying to create a mood. It's not like mood making. Um, and you're not saying to yourself like, oh, I'm going to get to this relaxed state and then I know that I'm there. That's again, that, that's trying, that's trying to get somewhere. That's trying. And the whole idea is to not try what you try to do is next to nothing. So it's shutting off. <laughs> um, not necessarily shutting off, kind of like going into almost like a trance or a zombie like state, just. Uh, going deeper, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I've always been curious about the meditation and all. So it's yeah. good to have a little bit of um, information, background, intro. Yeah. Small intro. Let's get on to, I would say, your favorite topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Mr. Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, just name one. <laughs> That's true. Yes, I could have won. What was your favorite name? <laughs> or what was your favorite alter ego yeah, that he had? His favorite alter ego. Um, I actually liked it like right whenever he dropped all the alter egos and he moved to Berlin and was just kind of like, I'm David Bowie now and I'm like, kind of like low profile. And um, I kind of liked it whenever, whenever he dropped all that, to be honest. Can you name all of his names? I, you know, <clears throat> that's actually... <clears throat> That's actually a very interesting question. I mean, I, I could. I, I, I can. I mean, um, however, in my opinion, I think that the media and maybe even the fans kind of created this mythology and that he was all these different characters. I don't know that he, like, okay, let's start with Ziggy Stardust, right? A lot of people think of David Bowie as Ziggy Stardust. Now, I don't know that he necessarily was playing that character. And if he was playing that character... It, it was a very loose character because there, there wasn't much background on who this guy was. The The album itself, I mean, I guess you could say it's a concept album, but there's no, like, real story there. It's almost like people created this mythology and, like... It's like uh, a fictional uh, rock band, I guess, is the yeah, consensus, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ziggy and, <clears throat> and the Spiders from Mars, yeah, it's definitely... Well, uh, the, but the story is very loose and the character, you know... Um, alt, supposed alter ego. I think that, I think that was largely constructed by by the fans and by critics. Mm. And then he became, they say, the thin white duke. Well, 
Right. Um, that was just, you know, taken from a line on the album uh, Station to Station. And I don't know, that was necessarily a character, per se, or Aladdin sane. Um, and really, you know, you, you could say maybe those are the only two characters that he played were maybe Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin sane. And beyond that, I mean, it was pretty much just... People just assumed that he was Ziggy Stardust, but yeah, yeah, from his yeah. perspective, that yeah, may I mean, have not even been the case. Right, I mean, he didn't come out and say, I'm Ziggy Stardust, and like I'm going to tell you a story, and, and I've like, also, this is my character. Yeah. I've heard that um, Ziggy Stardust, the song, he's referring to Jimi Hendrix. Have you heard that theory? I've heard that theory, so yeah. He played it left well, hand. And I, yeah, yeah, I think so, and I think it's about... Do you into that, or do you think that's another creation from uh, out, just people taking what they take from a song? Yeah, I think that that's created by... <laughs> by people but you never know with bowie um i don't think he would ever tell you mm -hmm. exactly what he meant that's he, something i love about him is never let you in yeah yeah um yeah I, I don't think that uh i think it's possible but i think that basically ziggy stardust is like his take on the archetypal um sort of like tragic you know um that what was it like the 27 club or something uh, mm -hmm. like all these rock stars that died at 27 it was kind of like the tragic mythical rock star um kind of character and that, that's what i think is so amazing about him is like he can just decide on what he wants to make what kind of album he wants to make and he'll make it like ziggy stardust have the rise and fall of ziggy, ziggy stardust happens to be like maybe my favorite album of his mm -hmm. and i always think like if if an alien came and said what's rock and roll i think i'd give him that album and say this is rock and roll it's yeah just, yeah well you know it's like the thing that's cool about the Ziggy Stardust thing is that it's kind of a rock and roll album, a, a kind of a but about. Uh, it's very uh, meta, <laughs> almost like metaphysical. It's it's um, it's kind of like a rock and roll album, but it, but it's um, it's not really a rock and roll album. It's about rock and roll, which is interesting. That's kind of what Bowie did. Is he kind of used rock and roll? Rock and roll was just one aspect of. But it wasn't just rock and roll for him. No, exactly. Either. That's like, right. <clears throat> it, almost like any genre that came about, he took it and did his way. Yeah, yeah. He kind of put it. his take on it. And I think uh, he said in an inter in an interview that kind of what he did is he would take like whatever the the vibe or the sound was of the times and kind of like fracture it and give people just like a new kind of perspective, a new angle, perfect on that. He would perfect it. In my opinion. Well, in my opinion. In my, in my, yeah, in my opinion. But he just wanted to provide an alternative. I mean, he's kind of the the um, the king of alternative, the originator of alternative rock because he was very conscious of, of what was going on, not just in the mainstream, but also the underground. And he would kind of fuse the two and just say, hey, here's an alternative to, to kind of what's going on. You see some of his music like as mainstream and do you dislike the mainstream mm. well Bowie's hits. interesting he's always kind of had a foot in the underground and in, in the experimental and you know kind of like the otherness uh, but then he's always had another foot firmly planted in kind of the mainstream and he's, he's like a star and he's been uh, he's he's a pop musician at the end of the day I mean he's it's popular music um, but it, you know so people say he's enigmatic and you know it it's true <laughs> like do you like the song space oddity i love the song it's space oddity okay. i think it's one of the best songs ever written now would that be so bowie fans aren't music snobs because you saying you like that i could see a big bowie fan being yeah, yeah. like that's not ours that right the mainstream right. took that song from us we don't like it anymore yeah i well, sort of sort of that's kind of how like that. Money from Pink Floyd, I hated that song for the longest yeah. time. Yeah. But now whenever I listen to it, I'm like, that's, that song is amazing. Right, yeah. I, I think that um, like mainstream radio and stuff, like you know, they, they can overplay things. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very popular song, but... I but mean, you, I've it's never, still good. I, I if you listen to it, I'm not going to turn that song we off. about money or are we talking about Space, yeah, Space Odyssey? Space Odyssey. Okay. I'm not going to turn that song off if, if it Space comes Space Odyssey <laughs> and Ziggy Pop. And Ziggy Pop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was I expecting you, honestly, Bowie. I was expecting you to not, to not, um, that, I wasn't expecting you to say I love that song. No, I love that. And you know what? 
uh, I love Let's Dance. I think that it's I was ask you about that quintessential too. 80s pop. Not just 80s pop, but pure... I mean, it's just a great pop song, a great dance song. Whenever you hear it at a wedding or any kind of an event, people dance. You can't... It's, it's physical. It is. You and can't it's, let that song pass you by without moving. It's like the bass is just so killer and like those little... Um, like horn jabs that come in, like everything about the production is just like it's just it's an epic pop song in my opinion, and uh, the the version most people hear, which is an edited like radio version, um, to me is not the definitive version. The album version is I think it's like seven minutes long or something, and it's uh, it's just got this amazing these amazing horns and uh, Nile Rogers from Chic is on there doing this really cool. Um, guitar stuff and um, Stevie Ray Vaughan is on that yeah. so um, it, it's uh, that's an amazing uh, song I mean it was it was a number one pop song and it maybe you know some people would argue that's not quintessential Bowie but for me it it, it really is it's it's an amazing uh, piece of work were you surprised by all the attention that his death created or they rose because I I was sort of it was surprising to me how much coverage his death got like it was, was on CNN too. Fox News everything and I, I know he's I an icon surprised. but yeah yeah I think you know I was I guess I was surprised how much he meant to to other people I agree um, I always thought oh you know we're we're few and far between Bowie fans I mean I'm a fanatic but um, but a lot of people were really were really moved I mean some of the tributes were really cool like I read what Mick Jagger had to say. That, that was a great tribute. Keith Richards, Paul McCartney. I mean, just, you know, it was really cool to see the biggest names, some of the most well-respected artists out there kind of pay tribute to him. Yeah, I, well, I expected it to be a one-day story, but it went well beyond it's that. It's still going on. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I heard this. This was uh, years ago, but was he... Did What's the word I'm looking for? Did he... Was he the most... Wealthy rock musician? I'm going to say probably no, but he was certainly very, very wealthy. He was an amazing, an amazing businessman. Actually, his friend, John Lennon, advised him kind of early on on how to kind of handle his finances and kind of how to manage his managers. And early on, I think he's, you know, he dropped having like managers or, uh, uh, like agents that were in charge of, you know, setting up his gig fees or whatever. He said, you know, I can do this on my own. You know, I want this much money to do this and, and so forth. He became very savvy. He created what he called Bowie bonds. Like people could buy into almost like stock in mm -hmm. his catalog. And so that was like, he was the first to do that. And um, he was, yeah, he was an amazing businessman. And, and he knew how to use media and manipulate media and he, and he had his fingers in so many different things you know mu you know he wasn't just a musician um so yeah uh, i would say he was very very wealthy very good businessman but probably not the richest i mean like jagger's got to have more mccartney's got to have more than bowie I, well um, he no not. no rap artist is sampling beatles songs i mean just the, if you you could probably find Every rap album is sampling Bowie, especially, I mean, maybe not now, but definitely in 90s, 80s, 90s, maybe not 2000s rap. Almost every album had a Bowie sample. That cost money. I mean, I think that his his influence um, in, a, in some way might have been spread even further than, than artists like the Beatles. Um I think that he influenced so many different kinds of people, and that's one of the things I'm realizing with the with all the tributes coming out. You know, like I was, I couldn't believe. You know, like Kanye West pays you know tribute to David well, Bowie. Okay. It was like, you know, but it it just goes to show, um, just you know how many uh, different kinds of artists he uh, maybe not even necessarily inspired. Like I don't know how inspired Kanye West's music is. You know, by David Bowie, M maybe indirectly it is, but. I think more than anything, it's just like a respect. It's like, you know. He, he didn't tour much, right? I mean, relatively uh, comparative to most rock bands. Well, he toured a lot uh, in the 70s. And then he had two huge, really, really huge tours in, in the 80s. 
And then in the, in the 90s, he actually, he toured a good bit, but they were like smaller club type things. But he hasn't, he didn't tour since uh, 2004. He had a heart attack. Mm. Actually, he started to have the heart attack, I think, on stage somewhere in Europe. And that, I think that just kind of spooked him. Um, so he, you know, in the last, in the last 10 years, he, he did not tour at all. When did, um, is that, is Bowie the first music you really got into? Like, did you start listening to him from a very young age? Uh, I think I started listening to Bowie whenever I was like, like really seriously listening whenever I was maybe like 12, 13. But right before Bowie, I got really into, uh, Queen, actually. And... I could probably thank Queen for really getting me into Bowie because I heard the song Under Pressure and just really, more than anything, just really liked his voice. And um, I just wanted to hear more. Are there songs you dislike of, of David Bowie? Oh, man. Um, you know, I'm not wild about it. I'm sure it'll grow on me. But actually on the new record, which I love, there is one song that um, I tend to skip. It's called Girl Loves Me. On the... The most current. Yeah, on the most current. Black, Black Star. Black Star, yeah. And, um, but I I actually played it on the jukebox at a bar last night, and I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty good. I just, I wanted to How hear it How do you usually again. listen to your music? I usually have it blasting in my apartment through two big speakers. Um, uh, I've, I recently had a note on my door from a neighbor <laughs> that said... And, and it was actually very funny. It said, please keep the music, TV, and this is the best part, and singing down. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently uh, I sing very loudly uh, whenever I'm listening to music. And yeah, that's true. At least they said please, I guess. You know what? Um, they're well within the right to complain. And it wasn't like a nasty letter, but the singing part just cracked me up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to sing something for us? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Next time B fifty two is, we will focus on them, yeah, and then yeah. you can sing. Yeah. Shall we move on to our uh, our Charlie Chestnut inspired mm. games here? Yeah. Let's oh, do the America's games. number one game. Let's do the games. Yes, Amer America's favorite game show, Charlie's <laughs> favorite game show. We're gonna see if you've been telling us the truth here. If you really are that knowledgeable on Bowie or if you just were talking out your ass which bring it on you did mention quite enough information to let me know that you weren't talking out your ass but let's see what we got here let's prove it and by the way before we get started on these games I want to say to anybody that hasn't like really like seriously dug into the Bowie catalog um, because I mean there's a lot of material there's a lot of places you could start um, the two you probably want to save for last, or or maybe even avoid, or tonight and never let me down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in my opinion, the best um, records, you know, like Ziggy's a classic. Everybody knows, like Stance and so forth. But um, you know, Hunky Dory, th those are all classics. But in my opinion, um, and I can say this without any hesitation, my top five Bowie records are Diamond Dogs. I mean, that's the first truly, truly great Bowie record. Um, controversial, I know. And uh, <laughs> so Di I would say Diamond Dogs, Station to Station, Low, which is might be his best, and one of his lesser known maybe uh, works. Low is amazing. It's totally groundbreaking. Um, Scary Monsters. Um, I think a lot of critics would probably point to that as being his best. It's definitely his most solid record, and then he put out one in the '90s that is just total mindfuck called "Outside." It's a really great album, and then of course the new one is uh, is definitely up there too. So. Okay, you prepped, Andrew? No. So we're doing like a name that tune, or what are we doing here? We're gonna do a name that tune, and I was gonna see. What do you think? Two seconds? You think two seconds? You can I think do that's plenty of time. Two seconds, I can probably name. This is it. I'm starting easy. Okay. I'm gonna start easy, and they're right. they're gonna get difficult. All right. Maybe I've had time. I've had about three. I got. I can so. do it on my. Okay. Thing right okay. here. Okay. Um, so. And for and you get two extensions. Okay. You get right. an additional. Two extensions. Additional. Or friend of friend. Okay. You <laughs> could do friend of friend, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Are you ready? I'm, I'm Name ready. that too. <laughs> Let's dance. 
You got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think These I are know. easy. I'm, I'm right. we're starting okay. easy. Okay. All right. You want to keep score? Yes, I, I will. About 15 songs. That was number one. Okay. Name that too. <laughs> Rebel, Rebel. You got it. Right. You're starting. To You're doing it before two there. songs. All right. Next song. Young Americans. Whew. Whew. <laughs> Heroes. <laughs> these are layups, so I know. I'm these. starting easy. I'm well, starting you're easy. a third through. I got 15 songs. Well, that was number what? Four? That was four. Ziggy Stardust. Jeez, what's next? A national anthem? Come on. <laughs> Starman. Was that Starman? That was Starman. Okay. Getting a little deep. I dig everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the first one where I'd had I'd been speechless. That's from like it's 1966 gonna get, or it's something. It's gonna start getting okay. harder now. Shake it. Yeah. <laughs> Over halfway. Yeah. Lady Stardust. That's a great tune. <laughs> that's, that's, it, that's it. She's got medals. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had them. That went that went to one and a half seconds, I think. What number are we up to? Wow, these 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 are ten. these are like Five, we're at ten. These are obscure. Wow. <clears throat> Name that too. Without you. That's right. <laughs> right again. Uh, song for Bob. Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. It's Superman. Yeah, correct. Are they getting harder, Ellie? <laughs> they are, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that last one took me, took two me a while. Two left? Life on Mars. Damn. These aren't that crazy hard. They're all from like the same it's four albums. two seconds. Albums. Two seconds. No, they're not. Are you ready for the last one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I know what that is. I do That's too. That's called Who Put the Red Sock in the Whitewash? Uh, yeah. That oh, it is? is? Correct. That is incorrect. <laughs> That's not even David Bowie, That's is it? It's not David Bowie. <laughs> you know what song that is? I, do. I threw a mixer in okay. there. Yeah, I know what this is. Sadly. Terrible I song. I, I really I... just wanted to make you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so... You did get 14 out of 14. Okay. So you win the prize. Nice. And this really made me think of you. <laughs> so here is your prize. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are we looking at here? <laughs> All right. This is what appears to be a moo moo. <laughs> A bunch, like, a bunch of blow up dolls. Yeah, this is like top. a sleeveless women woman's <laughs> That's um, beautiful. like blouse with uh, blow up dolls on. Well, you can wear that when you go to bed. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> and the tag says "Let's, Let's Rage." rage. <laughs> that is beautiful. Where do you Thank find you, that? Andrew. That was actually a gift to me, but I will well, never wear that. Okay, it will I, never even come out of my drawer. That looks drawer. very Charlie Chestnut. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I hope I get a chance to get into some freaky shit with that. Well, I'm uh, I'm very impressed with. Your uh, knowledge is David Bowie song. I am that impressed me. I am Two seconds each. Yeah. You knew it. I should have went to one second. I was nervous. I thought maybe the beers would, would slow me down. but uh, Apparently not even not even close to that. Yeah. Maybe I should have went with some more obscure songs. That was. Uh, there were some obscure ones in there. She's Got Medals. Yeah, <laughs> that's I never song. got that. I don't that's, even a know. Great, that's a great song. Yeah. Too. I mean, I think I've heard that one, listened to it the whole way through once. Okay, now you can even play my game, Andrew, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be a little round of who said it, David Bowie or, okay. or me. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. So these uh, are, these are, are they song quotes or these are quotes? No, no, no. These quotes. are quotes. Okay. You know, which I always found interesting how it seems that all these uh, rock stars and famous musicians always have these great quotes. Now, you yeah. think these are just probably plucked from interviews? Like, they don't sit around every day coming up with these crazy quotes, right? I mean, I was, who knows? I mean, with Bowie, who knows? Uh, he was such a yeah, such a performer, but um, no, yeah, it, it's true. I think a lot of rock, like, a lot of rock stars, um, there's like a, there's a definite segment of the population that 
sees them as degenerates and definitely not intellectuals. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, they're some of our greatest minds, I think. So. Well, as am I. So some of All these right. are mine. <laughs> no doubt. I, okay. I would not argue that you can't won, wait to hear uh, the inspiration I get from you. What was that category <laughs> you played? Oh, I'm a categories. Whiz. Categories genius. Whiz. Yeah. Okay. First quote. I always had a repulsive need to do... That's Bowie. That's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why would you just say the first two words? <laughs> yeah, you get two seconds. Two words. Mr. Chestnut yeah. can get them. Well... Read the, read the quote, though. It's a good quote. I always had a repulsive need to be something more than human. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, you wouldn't say that. Okay. Now, hey... That's that's true. That's true. <laughs> now, if you want to wait, you don't have to wait. If you can get it before I'm done, go for it. Okay. Otherwise, guess and then it. Yeah, give then me a it, chance. Then you can guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. But if you know it, I'd say fire it off. Right. Okay. This one, I assure you, you might know, because I say it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> John Hen. I'm an instant. Star. John. <laughs> I'm an instant star. Just add water and stir. That is Bowie. Yeah, I, I gave that one away. That was stupid. Okay, we ready? I'd like to go back into space someday. John. <laughs> John. John said that. Now, if I could have kept it together, would you have made me guess? Really? Hold on, is that the whole quote? Yeah. That's you. That sounds like something you would say, though. <laughs> I'd like to go back into space someday. All right. So you're you're doing good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep it together here. Yeah. I'm always amazed that people like what I say seriously. Take what I say seriously. I don't even take what I am seriously. That sounds something you'd say. I'm going to say Bowie. That's a Bowie quote. Okay. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is start dreaming. Mm. John. I'm, I'm going to say John. That's David Bowie. <laughs> no, no, that's me. <laughs> oh, man, that is me. That is you, okay. Yeah, it's that, that's, a, that's a good quote. That's actually... There's, I was trying to think I like it that there's irony in there. Yeah. And, um, when you wake up, you're dreaming. See, I thought, dreaming. I thought it was yeah. deep enough that it you'd is be deep. like, that's got to be Bowie. Well, that, that's why I was torn. I just... Okay. Yeah. It's gay. <laughs> Dancing costs nothing. Sounds something I would say. That's you. That's you, John. Bowie. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've been out of my mind for over a decade now. Mm, John. Bowie. John. We say Steve. I'm gonna say Bowie. That's me. Oh shit. I'm not very articulate. John. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna. That's I'm definitely not... Bowie. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Bowie too. That's yeah. Bowie. Yep. <laughs> I don't write my songs. <laughs> <laughs> we all write my songs. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to say for the hell of it, Bowie. Uh, John. That's me. That's, a, <laughs> I was, that's such a weak attempt. No, that's, but listen, that, that, is, that is something Bowie would say. Really. I don't he, write my songs. We he, all write yeah, my songs. He, he, had a, he had a great sense. I tried to do this in Bowie's voice, but right. it did not work very well. And last one. You're doing excellent. Some songs you really don't want to write. Bowie. Bowie. That is Bowie. I think you did them all except for the one you gave me, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nut. <laughs> so my game was a bummer because I couldn't keep it together, but I was trying no, to that, think of that, it that, as that a was good. That was, that was very good. Okay. I'm still very impressed on your knowledge of Bowie. It all worked. Or Ziggy Pop. <laughs> Ziggy Pop. <laughs> and Iggy Stardust. <laughs> and the roaches from Jupiter. <laughs> Goddamn pompous ass. Boo. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with here as we Got sign any plugs. off? Any plugs? Where can we find you? Yeah, uh, plugs and well, I'll, I'll parting plug, words. I'll plug where I work, adultempire.com. You should pay for your porn because that'll help keep us in business and... Um, it seems like you guys are doing all right. We're doing all right, actually. Yeah, we're growing. Um, I don't know. I don't want to um, leave. Uh, <coughs> I don't want to leave people with anything other than um, you know. Yeah, it was it was good to talk about Bowie. Um, you know, it hasn't even been a week I think since he died, and um, 
You know, I would just say um, if you're a music fan and you have any curiosity, you should um, you should check it out. Even if it doesn't t you know touch you on the level uh, that it has me or some other people, uh, it's it's worth um, exploring. He definitely made uh, life more interesting. And you know, long live Bowie and. Uh, thank God, I just want to say, for the miracle of recorded music, it is such a miracle that <clears throat> just to be able to, excuse me, to um, to record music and have it last virtually forever, and it's a relatively new thing that we have. It's like, you know, people say, oh, you know, the airplane or the computer, you know, whatever, you know, are the greatest inventions of all time. For me, it's recorded music. Being able to, in the comfort of your own home, just sit there and experience an album time and time again, it's, it's, it's just it's fucking amazing. It's, it's mind-blowing. So, yeah, long live Bowie, long live recorded music. Um, pay for your music. Don't illegally download. And um, if you like an artist, support that artist. And long live uh, the creative spirit. And... Um, I, I guess that's it. I would say that sums it up. And yeah. it was a pleasure having you here. Thanks. Love you too. Bye.